Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Teresa Welsh. I'm a senior reporter with DevEx, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to the second in a series of DevEx Newsmaker events focused on Latin America. Uh, they are presented by the Open Society Foundations. I'm joined today by DevEx President and Editor-in-Chief Raj Kumar. Welcome, Raj. Hey, Teresa. Nice to see you. I'm excited to, uh, to be with you today. Nice to see you as well. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to be chatting about today. So today's newsmaker is focused on uh, U.S. foreign policy in the Latin American Caribbean region. We're talking to Roberta Jacobson, who is a big name in this space. I'm sure many of you who are following this know of her well. Uh, she was the ambassador to Mexico. She was also the assistant secretary of state uh, for Western Hemisphere. But you know, most recently, she spent the first 100 days in the Biden administration inside the White House, working directly with the president and the national security team on the border crisis on migration, thinking about the issues in the Northern Triangle. So I, I think that's going to dominate a lot of our conversation today. Um, this is the second in our three-part series that we're doing on Latin American Caribbean. We're doing the series because we feel like the moment is really, the spotlight is really on the region. I mean, this is the region hit hardest in the world by the pandemic, both from a health and an economic standpoint. And we think it deserves more attention and we need to think about what some of the solutions could be. So our first session was with Luis Alberto Moreno, who was the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, thinking about the economic challenges and inequality. Today with Roberta Jacobson, it's gonna be very focused on migration, on democracy, on especially this issue of the Northern Triangle. So I'm excited to hear what she has to say on sort of the US foreign policy, the US administration's perspective on these issues. Yeah, she's such a great authority on these topics, such deep experience with the US foreign policy establishment. So we'll be chatting with Roberta and then we have another guest joining us as well, correct? We do, we do. So th these series of events is supported by the Open Society Foundations. They're our presenting partner. And we've got Pedro Obramage with us who is known of course for his role at OSF today at the Open Society Foundations where he is the director of their regional uh, program for Latin American Caribbean, but he's also known to the community following along here as the former Secretary of Justice. Um, he spent a long career in the Department of Justice in Brazil. So I think we're going to get to hear a little bit more about Brazil when we speak with him, which I'm looking forward to. Um, and then we're going to wrap up. I'll see you again at the very end of this, and we can talk a little bit about the next, uh, the third and final session that we have in this series of Newsmakers. That sounds great. And before you jump into the conversation with Roberta, is there anything else our audience should know? I just want to mention to people that if you'd like to hear this session in Spanish and you're following along in our Zoom chat here, you can choose the, the option for Spanish. Um, if you're following us on social media, you don't get that option, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have questions, comments, feedback, let us know. Um, I'm at Raj underscore DevX on Twitter, and I know our colleagues uh, at DevX around the world would love to hear what you think of this session and to get your, your input. So thanks for being a part of it today. All right, Raj, thanks so much. Really looking forward to your conversation with Roberta. I'm delighted to be here with Roberta Jacobson for the second of our series of conversations around Latin America, what's coming post-pandemic, what are some of the challenges and opportunities. This is brought to us with underwriting support from the Open Society Foundations. Really appreciative of that support and just great to see Roberta and be with you here today. Um, you are someone I think really well known to people who do this kind of work and focus on the region. You've spent your whole career uh, leading on Latin America issues inside the U.S. foreign U.S. government and the foreign policy establishment um, in many different roles. Well known as people can read there as the former U.S. ambassador to Mexico, but you were also uh, in the Biden administration uh, very, fairly recently in the first hundred days focused on the border. Um, you've held a number of roles in the State Department over the years. You're now a senior advisor at the Albridge Stone, uh, the Albright Stonebridge Group. Uh, it's just great to have you here, Roberta, to have this conversation. Thanks, Raj. It's great to be here. So maybe we can just start at a high level. Um, there's a lot happening in the region. We've talked about in prior conversations the fact that the Latin America as a region broadly has been hit the hardest by the pandemic. And that's both from a health and an economic perspective. There's po severe political instability pre-pandemic. Some of it may be quieted down when there were lockdowns. Some of it's coming back in places like Chile. Give us your high level view. Of what's going on? I know it's a very diverse region, but what's going on across Latin America and the Caribbean from a development and democracy perspective? What do you see happening? Well, thank you. And I'm just delighted to have this conversation with you along with such distinguished other uh, uh, luminaries uh, with Luis Alberto Moreno, with Santiago Levy and others. I think, 
you know, if you look at the region right now, it's it's a little bit easy um, to to fall into a certain amount of despair about where things are. Not just because there were promising signs before pandemic, there were also slowdowns, and the the inequality was fairly great before pandemic. But I think, in, in some ways, what the pandemic did was just exacerbate traits that already existed, exacerbate inequalities um, and slowdowns in the economy, but also expose some of the fault lines that we knew needed attention, but but maybe expose them uh, more, more starkly. Um, things like the failure to really um, connect our infrastructure. We talk a lot about integration among countries, whether it's Pacific Alliance or free trade agreements or other things. Um, but in fact, even in the most connected of the subregions in, in the Western Hemisphere, and that's North America, we saw supply chains completely break down due to pandemic um, and a failure of really good alignment and cooperation. So I, I think there's a huge amount that we've learned from the pandemic to confront the challenges the region faces. But I also think that the challenges that face us are, are larger than they were two years ago. Um, for, yeah. I, I was just going to mention it is it's fascinating that a region that is so close to the United States geographically, right, has often gotten less attention than other parts of the world in the U.S. foreign policy establishment. And maybe that's part of this issue of the lack of tight supply chains, close trade relationships, you know, integrated markets uh, that you're pointing to. And I, I wonder if you agree and you feel the same way that our relationship with Latin America has sometimes been deprioritized. Well, if you ask a, a Latin America expert who has spent most of her career in the U.S. government, um, the answer is going to be absolutely yes, that we have never paid enough attention to this region. And that so sort of for good or ill. I mean, there are people who say that benign neglect is probably the best you can get from the United States. My own view has always been that a lot of the global issues that we're seeing today, whether they are pandemics, whether they are corruption, whether they are um, civil military relations, uh, environmental and climate change, all of those things in some ways are, are not just evident, but at their most problematic in this region. And yet the U.S. foreign policy establishment, if you will, and that's not a monolithic block, but the U.S. foreign policy establishment spends way more time on other parts of the world, which in my view have always been not of lesser importance to the United States, but in many ways have less direct and daily impact on as many Americans as does the Western Hemisphere um, for reasons of um, ancestry and culture, for reasons of proximity, obviously, and for reasons, I would argue, at root, despite challenges and differences um, of similar values, we ought to be the most in sync and paying the most attention to this part of the world, and yet we haven't over the years. Um, we are, our attention is fleeting, it's, it's episodic, um, and then we turn away again. And that, that's been a real problem. To me, the real, um, at root, the challenges right now are challenges of democracy. And I say that because I think that the challenges of democracy are not just political challenges. They're not just uh, human rights and universal precepts of, of democracy and the fairness of elections. They in fact have very direct effects on the development of these countries, on the ability to overcome pandemics, on their economic future. Um, and the, the crisis in democracy is not just a crisis as to whether we will have democratically elected leaders or not, looking at Nicaragua, um, you see the most extreme example of it upcoming. You will see another extreme example of the failure or lack of democracy or illiberal um, uh, rule by uh, the Maduro regime in Venezuela. But in fact, even in places where democracy has held, right, so far Chile, thank goodness, Colombia, other places, um, you have a very deep... Um, a, a failure of democratic governments to deliver to their populations on the very issues, inequality, humanitarian crises, pandemic, um, that, that they are most concerned with. And so when democratically elected governments either don't rule democratically 
or in fact don't deliver what governments owe to their people. And, and that in its most basic sense, even whatever ideology you, you pick, democratic governments are at, at root supposed to provide for the safety and security of their citizens. And that has been a notable failure in a region that has among the most dangerous cities in the world. Um, then you have people questioning the utility, the benefit, of democracy itself. And, and all of those other things are impeded. So to me, that crisis in democracy in the region is, is the root of, of everything else. That's such a great point. And in fact, there was that recent Ibero-America uh, poll that came out that The Economist publishes every year. And they showed that now 25% of their respondents across the region say they don't care whether their government right. is democratic or authoritarian. Right. And it suggests, and it's not that they, they saw a big uptick in people wanting an authoritarian government. No. It suggests people are just looking for services to be delivered, right? And in Chile, in fact, the poll showed 93% of Chilean respondents saying that, that healthcare provision in the country was basically unfair. And that's one of the root causes of their protest movement. So I get your point that ultimately this democratic issue is getting to the linchpin of, of what's causing the unrest in the region. You use the word root causes a couple of times. I know you've worked on that issue in the Biden administration, right? And the Biden administration put out this root causes strategy for Central America. What do you think about the ability of the development community, USAID and others to address those root causes? What do you think we, what, what opportunities are there? So I, I do think there are opportunities and I would say they, they fall into a couple of categories. One, and I really feel strongly about this is We've got to refocus our attention, especially in places where we're working on these kinds of underlying inequalities and root causes for, for the lack of development. We have to focus not just on governments, and, and we will have to work with governments on some aspects of it, but we've got to focus on civil society. Um, and I think the administration is trying to to make that adjustment, that's, that's very difficult, both for capacity reasons and for certain things that you must have government to do, safety and security for one. <laughs> but I think the second thing that, that I've learned over the years is that if we really want to actually make change, we have to focus a little bit younger in our demographic. Um, one of the things I used to say to people in Mexico when I was ambassador, was if I was getting overly cynical or, or negative um, about the way things were going, um, I would say, please quick get me a youth event, right? And, and the reason for that was, was entirely selfish in one respect, right? It, was, it would make me feel better. But the reason it made me feel better was the optimism, the creativity, the innovation that younger actors brought to the table, I, I think was critically important. And so as I get older, <laughs> And my generation, in some respects, has failed to, to solve some of these problems. I think we need to make sure we're engaging with young people, engaging with actors who are earlier in their careers, more open-minded about what might work. Let's face it, a lot of the problems in these countries when we're talking about root causes is a lack of seeing a, a viable and better future for their children that older people may have. And so we need to focus, in Mexico, they're called the ninis, elsewhere they're called something else. Young people who may not be going to school and who may not be able to work. And those people are, in essence, the fodder that criminal organizations and others use to exploit for contraband, whether that's smuggling people, smuggling drugs, smuggling arms, um, et cetera. And so it seems to me that our focus needs to not just be how do we strengthen civil society and enable people to make their lives better, regardless of whether or not their government does, um, but how do we also reach people who are younger, who have more to gain from benefits, and who probably have better ideas about how things can be done um, and haven't fallen prey yet to the cynicism um, of some of us who've been working for a long time. Yeah, that, that reminds me of the announcement that uh, USAID Administrator Sam Power just made um, recently here that some $300 million will be directed over five years if they can get the congressional support for the funding 
you know, into civil society groups in Central America. Obviously, the border issue, the migration issue is such a big one. Um, this is something that you saw in the Biden, in the Obama Biden administration as well. Is there an opportunity to invest in local groups, maybe youth led groups in these countries? I mean, it feels like some of this work has happened and been done, but the scale of the crisis is so big. I think that's right. I think that's right. Some of this work has been done. Some of the lessons learned, I think, have to be built on, not just recreated. Um, certainly, let's make sure that if we make mistakes, they're different mistakes. But, but part of what you're getting at is exactly right. It's scale. It's scale of both the problem, but it's also scale of the solution. If you look at areas where AID and the UN and its specialized agencies or other um, NGOs and civil society have made progress, um, especially in the Northern Triangle, Southern Mexico, other places. Um, one of the biggest problems is the inability to replicate those positive uh, examples, those success stories, either in other places and certainly to scale. That's to some extent where you have to have governments come in, right? We can do a lot from outside government to replicate those efforts. But in the end, unless the government is really a partner and says, okay, you have now had success with a particular model, let's say a vocational training in five, 10 different municipalities, we're now going to launch a program that's going to put this in 100 municipalities or 200 municipalities. That's what has always worried me is what I don't necessarily see is what you want to do is you want to have governments that say, you've got a success. I'm now going to make it mine. Fine. Right. We're, the, the best projects are ones in which nobody has to, um, you know, trumpet their own ownership of it. Um, plagiarizing in this case would be the, the sincerest form of flattery and would and would give politicians a win, too. Um, but this is where I, I worry the most, right? Where do we have good partners, right? Do we have good partners in national governments in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras? Um, I think we can answer that least, question, right? It's uneven, not, not easy. Uneven, uneven to say the least in some places, worse than uneven. Um, and in the end, we're going to need partners. Um, in some places that may be a mayor or a provincial leader. It may not be the, the national government. In other places, it may be a national government that's willing to come in behind um, the, the, the successes. And then the other thing I would say, and this has been written about and talked about a fair amount lately, but I'm not sure I necessarily see any change is, what is the private sector going to do? Um, I think the private sector in many countries in the region has yet to understand the importance of better delivery of these services to their own, you know, consumers, employees, um, you know, the, the, the kids in gangs who may be threatening them. And I think in the Northern Triangle in particular, but elsewhere in the region as well, you have socioeconomic elites who frankly have been very comfortable with the situation as it now exists. And they are very afraid of opening things up, of having greater change. Um, so I, I think that, that to make them partners um, is absolutely critical. They have to be stakeholders in this. And, and that has to be a, a real focus um, of attention. Um, a idea a while back um, had begun to do projects in which the U.S. government will put up, let's say, a third of the money, but the local private sector had to put up two thirds. So, so they were invested in the project. And maybe they would help you convince the, the national government eventually that it was something they should be doing. Um, you also had efforts at times, um, it was tried in Honduras in the past, to implement taxes specifically for either development goals or security goals. Um, we all know that one of the successes in Colombia was, in essence, at that time, a war tax, right? People needed to be um, committed with their funds to the president's program. But if governments don't have much credibility, um, either because of corruption or because they're lame ducks, um, 
or there's not a good working relationship between those two, people say, well, I'm not going to pay an additional tax to have the government misspend it. So you got to figure out some hybrid ways, their private, public-private partnerships to make this work such that the private sector is truly invested in this. And I don't see that yet, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, think about the, the protests in Colombia earlier this spring, and they were sparked by a relatively small, modest increase in taxes that the government was proposing. But people said enough is enough, and they, they took the streets all over the country. In Chile, I think it was bus fares going up by a modest amount. There is a sense that, especially these younger people you're talking about, who are not in school, not in work, that they are really squeezed, right? And yeah. I, I wonder, I'll ask you what I asked Luis Alberto Moreno. Do you think there's a chance, given all the protests we saw pre-pandemic, that we might be at a moment as the lockdowns ease, as there's higher vaccination rates, of a wave of protests across many of the countries we're talking about today? Could we see something akin to an Arab Spring happen across the, the region in Latin America? I think an awful lot depends on what happens in a number of pretty crucial elections coming up. Um, Honduras is, is an obvious one. Chile, both the presidential election and the constituent assembly, there you've got two things that appear to be moving in slightly opposite directions. You have the right coming on fairly strong uh, electorally in Chile and a constituent assembly that, that is markedly leftist drawing up a new constitution. How those things come together in the end um, is going to be crucial to whether people feel like their grievances are being addressed. Um, Colombia obviously is, is in a very, very dicey position right now. Peace brought with it a certain um, irrational exuberance, perhaps, and there was a great deal of, of expectation um, when those did not materialize quickly, when response to those did not materialize quickly. And you have, you have a, a definite um, disillusionment with, with the current government. I think one of the things that's been so noticeable in all of these countries, and, and goodness knows we've seen it in the United States, is this polarization. Um, a, a Chilean diplomat recently lamented to me that Chile no longer has mandatory voting in its elections and his fear that, that the people who would vote were from either side, the extremes, that the center which had so long held in Chile um, would, would not be able to. That is a, a theme you see throughout the, the region, whether it's Pedro Castillo in Peru or, or others, um, the center not holding, but that center, to the extent that it it regains power or it uh, has a voice, has to be able to demonstrate delivery, right? Delivery of services, delivery of uh, of of opportunities. And yes, the pandemic made that infinitely more difficult for so many governments. Um, but but there is a way to get back to that. Uh, I think that that I don't necessarily see leaders promoting. Um, and, and it's very, very disturbing. What do you think it means for migration? I mean, the fact that you were, you were in the Biden administration in the White House for those first 100 days, we've seen kind of new kinds of migration. I mean, look at the, yeah. the Haitian migrants who came, some of them coming from Southern South America. I mean, right. un unbelievably arduous journeys. What do you see as kind of the trends behind these issues? I think it's a really interesting point because the migration phenomenon has become much more complex over the last three to five years and certainly demonstrated recently so that it isn't just countries contiguous to the United States. Um, as you rightly point out, many of the Haitians who were coming to the United States were coming from Southern South America, having been outside of Haiti, some of them for as much as a decade. Um, you also had from a very low base, but you also had and continue to have increasing number of, of uh, numbers of people who turn up on the U.S.-Mexico border having come from outside the region. Right. So people are willing to take these extraordinary risks and, and dangerous long journeys. Um, but what it underscores, I think, to us, to the U.N., the IOM and others is if we can't deal with this phenomenon, I'll put aside globally for a minute and just say regionally, then um, then we're never going to tackle it because it it isn't just a border phenomenon. And as as somebody that I worked with in the past once said, and he was absolutely right, 
if your policies on migration focus on the US-Mexico border or even the Mexico-Guatemala border, it's too late, you've lost, right? We know, for example, that people who migrate out of Central America, especially Honduras and Guatemala, have often moved internally multiple times before they take that step of crossing an international border. And we haven't really addressed it as a community, right? Where are the programs for those who are internally displaced? Where are the programs to move people internally before they might migrate out of areas that are affected um, terribly by climate change or by security issues and ensure that they have some place safe and potentially an opportunity economically before they take that step? Um, I think we need to do a lot more of our focus regionally. Um, the region we know. Um, is only as strong as kind of the, the weakest link. So, you know, for many years, Ecuador was visa free. And that meant that no matter what other countries did, everyone could come in via Ecuador if they wished. Um, and so we have to get back to a regional conversation on this, whether it's at the Summit of the Americas, the OAS General Assembly, uh, a regional meeting that's separate or, or uh, connected to the UN. We have let migration focus much too much on borders. Um, and, and we've seen, for example, that countries in the region like Colombia, like Peru, like Brazil, uh, neighbors of Venezuela have done extraordinary things for migrants who've come to their countries um, and, and didn't get much help, frankly. So I think a lot more needs to be done and not as much focus as as politically important as it is in the United States on the southern border, but much more focus on regional conditions and regional solutions. Right. The southern border is that symptom that's so far late in the exactly. process. If a mother is willing to send an unaccompanied child all the way to the border, the issue she's been grappling with long before must have been Correct. so severe to get to that point. That's right. And obviously, we haven't even talked about climate and how that's affecting potentially greater migration. I do wonder what you think about this issue of misinformation um, and disinformation. You know, it's it's there's more and more rumblings that that is a, a key cause behind the Haitian migration, for example, we've seen recently. What what's what's been your take on that issue? Is is part of this issue people are hearing that the borders are open or getting stories through Facebook and other social media platforms that just aren't true about uh, whether or not to come to the United States? Yeah, it's absolutely a huge part of it. Um, interviews with migrants, both along the 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 trip and at the in in the U.S., have definitely proved that people had heard things that that weren't true. Certainly, at the beginning of the Biden administration, the perception um, that the borders were going to be open, um, the accurate perception that the Biden administration was going to be more humane than its predecessor, um, that that part wasn't misinformation. Um, but that the border was open. And, and frankly, I think what you need to understand, um, and, I, and I know that you and a lot of the, the listeners do, is governments will always be slower and worse at getting the accurate information out than um, criminal organizations or even informal networks are at getting misinformation out. So we, we can't sit around and bemoan the fact that we have said 900 times in as many ways as we could think of, this is the truth, that is not the truth, et cetera. Um, it, it is also true that people heard from their families, people are getting in. Or someone had gotten in and was having their asylum claim uh, processed, um, possibly for three to six years. So they made a decision that is not illogical. And so we need to try and find ways to address the concerns and the fears and, and even get at the disinformation in the countries of the Northern Triangle or Haiti or, or anywhere else um, with programs, not just public announcements, with programs that will give people legal avenues to come to the U.S. Remember that one of the reasons I don't know what the percentage is, but it's extraordinarily high. The percentage of migrants who now apply for asylum upon entering the U.S., one of the reasons they're doing that is because we have closed off so many other options for migration. We've closed off economic options. We've narrowed them to um, all, you know, virtually only Mexicans for H-2As. 
The H2Bs are difficult. Um, we've seen the effect on our own economy. We need to find ways to make other options available, available because we know that many of the migrants will not qualify for asylum. Um, but we know they'll also try again if we don't have other options, either options preferably that are in their home country or work options in the United States that don't require uh, proof of, of uh, asylum status. Yeah, that's an example of a policy shift that as we get to a close, so much of what you're talking about are really about implementation issues, yeah. you know, about delivery. Um, you're saying we've got to get more local. We've got to think about how to provide people the services that they need in their context, in their community. And I guess I wonder, as we come to a close here, thinking of the people following along in the DevX and the development community, people who run projects or implement uh, organizations, uh, social entrepreneurs and others in the region, what, what's your message to them, the ones who are working on this, who might feel that we're coming out of this pandemic, uh, at least in a lot of the world, not everywhere, and the situation economically is worse than it was before the pandemic. Latin America, I think the IMF says they might might get back to pre-pandemic levels by 2023. Yeah. Um, what, what, you know, given the, the lack of attention we talked about, the lack of resources, the challenges, but the need for better delivery, what would you say to the, the people who are working on those issues right now? What else they could do to help address the, the realities of the current context? So I guess one of the first things I would say is thank you. Um, for those who have been working and will continue to work in development, it is often incredibly thankless and challenging. And, and as you know very well, the, the progress is often incremental, not, not leaps and bounds. And, um, and I, I am incredibly grateful to the professionals who dedicate their lives to that. Um, the second thing I would say is that it, it is a, a very difficult time in the developed world, if you will, um, to be asking for these things, right? The, the developed world itself, the global north, whatever, um, is facing some of those same challenges and therefore is finding it, I, I think, harder to lead in a way that's coherent and, and promising for our development professionals. Um, but I would say that um, there is an understanding in this administration and, and I think in, in the US more broadly that, that we're all connected, that, that what we do affects everybody else. Right, whether it's through migration, whether it's through trade that isn't happening because people don't have the money to buy things, um, or, or or climate or pandemics, the recognition. I mean, debates over globalization sound increasingly absurd, right? We're, we are connected through things that are transnational, whether we like it or not. But I also think that out of the out of that recognition comes the the seeds of the the resolution. Um, that connectivity has to be promoted. It has to be strengthened. Um, the isolationism of the past is not going to work anymore. And we need to listen to the professionals. There is, I think, an understanding of the need to listen to those professionals, whether it's about agriculture, whether it's about um, ways to mitigate and, and uh, adapt uh, to climate change. Um, whether it's about resilience, um, we, we are more and more, I think, um, in need of the professionals who will give us ideas, give us creativity, and work with partners um, in this increasingly sort of uh, connected world that, that people not give up, that they focus on local, that they focus on democracy as a, and transparency as a way of delivering uh, development because it will inculcate the kind of skills that are needed even in the political sector and the economic sector. And that I guess I'm ultimately always an optimist. Um, I am a glass half full person. You don't work in the US government for 31 years if you don't fundamentally believe that things can get better. Um, Latin America has come out of some, or the Western hemisphere in general has come out of some really dark times in the past. Things that were difficult to, to see um, getting over. Um, and they did put those things behind them. And I think the next generation of leaders 
can do a hell of a lot better than the previous one um, if they're given the tools. And, and that's what the development community does is, is give the tools and the capacity um, to do better than, than we have. You're such a thoughtful voice on these issues, Roberta. It's so great to, to hear you and to hear an optimistic note at the end, too, given all the challenges that there really is incredible work happening and, and that that work needs to be scaled and furthered. Uh, it's just been a joy to get to spend some time with you. Thank, thank you, you for, for being a part of this today. Uh, former Ambassador Roberta Jacobson, thank you. Thank you. Great conversation. Appreciate it. Well, I want to welcome to the conversation Pedro Obramage, who is the Program and Regional Director at the Open Society Foundations in charge of Latin America. And uh, it's fantastic to have you here, Pedro. Many people following this may know you as the former Secretary of Justice under President Lula's administration, obviously a very different administration than the one currently in power in your home country of Brazil. Um, and you've got a long history working in, on issues of freedom and democracy and as a, as a member of the senior staff at the Department of Justice in the country. Um, I'd love your take just to start on what you thought of Ambassador Jacobson's remarks. Um, you know, it's a big and it's a diverse region, of course, Latin America and the Caribbean. But at a high level, what did you think of her take on the current situation? No, I think it's always a pleasure to hear uh, Ambassador Jacobson. And I, and I agree with a lot of her uh, diagnosis uh, about the region, about the level of the crisis right now. What are, you know, trying to build, build back the, 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 the region after... Uh, the pandemic, the level of inequality of unemployment, the climate challenge, and the migration challenge. I think there are some uh, issues that I think it would be important to uh, uh, look a, a little bit closer. And I think this connection between corruption and democracy is one that we need to pay more attention. Um, Ambassador Jacobson talks about the importance of supporting civil society. And I think that is that right. Uh, because a lot of the cooperation that the United States had with the region on anti-corruption uh, um, uh, policies were with governments, were, were, uh, was with uh, uh, law enforcement. And there is, I think it's important for us to recognize right now that if you support anti-corruption policies without supporting democracy, without supporting uh, free press, without supporting civil society organizations that will have democracy as a value in the country, there is a risk of backlash. There is a risk that what, what people are seeing as corruption it's they take for uh, democracy itself. And there is a risk that authoritarian leaders will emerge from that. We are seeing that, of course, in Central America in some cases. And then the consequences is that all the anti-corruption work, so people that will be elected with the anti-corruption agenda become authoritarian, are, are the authoritarian leaders, and quickly they dismantle the, the anti-corruption institution. And the only thing that, that, we, that we have to fight against it is civil society. We saw that in Central America, and we are seeing that in Brazil, which for me was a big absence. In in um, in Brazil, has one third of the population in the region, and I think it's interesting that it doesn't appear in a conversation about democracy, especially looking what's happening right now in Brazil. In democracy, it is at risk uh, in Brazil, and Brazil represents today an existential threat for humanity because yeah, of let's, the let's dig. Let's dig into this a little bit more. I mean, just to, to put a pin in some of what you're talking about in Central America, I think you're at least partly referring to, you know, Vice President Harris's trip to Guatemala, her press conference where she talked about an anti-corruption task force, the president of the country sort of visibly disagreed with her. Um, and, and there's a real tension here. It's to me, it's a bit like countries that focus on, on elections as though that's the whole story around democracy, right? You're saying there's a much deeper history, certainly in Brazil, just turning to Brazil, Obviously, the prosecutors, the federal prosecutors played such a big role in you know, holding the line on, on what counts as good government. Uh, so give us your read. You, you were in the Department of Justice there, and you're saying yeah. Brazil is at this very crucial moment. There's an election coming next year. The former president you work with is, is running against the current president. Give us your state of play there. And is democracy really on the line in Brazil today? It is. And I think that, that Brazil, I think it's a good example for us because uh, there was a, a, a gigantic work on building anti-corruption institutions, and those institutions, they've created uh, uh, a, new actors, prosecutors, judges, that became politicians at the end, right? And that uh, now the judge that convicted, uh, that you know, was uh, important for the car wash operation, just launched his presidential, uh, presidential uh, uh, 
candidacy, right? So I think this mix between law enforcement organization and politics that put, you know, that has a speech that every policy that exists in the country is corrupt. This is uh, uh, threatening for democracy, right? And then you can elect a leader that, as Bolsonaro, was elected with an anti-corruption speech, but quickly dismantled completely the anti-corruption institutions, copted uh, uh, the, the attorney general, right? And today is uh, uh, Brazil has a, a crisis with uh, accountability institutions in the country. And that, I think, reflects in other areas, right? So, for example, the complete denial of climate change, right, and the policy of deforestation in Amazon is also a consequence of that, of this authoritarian uh, uh, perspective that President Bolsonaro uh, is bringing to the country. So I think the lesson that we have from Brazil to El Salvador is, of course, we need anti-corruption work, but this needs to be completely connected with democracy uh, uh, work, with civil society that is strongly defending democracy, with the freedom of press, because if it's not, then uh, anti-corruption becomes anti-politics. Got it. So your, your argument is not that we shouldn't do anti-corruption, but that on its own can't be the pillar of policy in the region. It has to be connected to a broader agenda. Obviously, these are long-term issues, you know, building civil society, building up a free press, fighting corruption. But we have a lot of short-term deadlines in a way. You're talking about an election next year in Brazil. Many countries in Latin America, I mean, look at Chile right now with a, a constitutional rewrite underway. How do, how do we manage the current immediate crises, the humanitarian crises in the Northern Triangle, in Venezuela, in Haiti, and the migration that's happening now? How do we manage those current crises with the long-term agenda? How are you doing that at the Open Society Foundations? So I think there are some opportunities in the region right now, right? And I think the pandemic has raised some issues uh, for us that I think that uh, I think will be part of any recovery. One is the climate crisis, and I think there are two aspects of it. In the Amazon, it is we need to stop the deforestation, and you know Brazil, for example, has half of its emissions comes from deforestation itself. So cutting the emissions there, it's cutting uh, the deforestation, and thinking about an economy that has the Amazon as a, a, a positive thing, right? Think of the standing forest as, a, as a, an asset for uh, developing the economy. So this is something that there is international money for that. So this is an opportunity. In other cases like Central America, there is, we need to completely shift the economic priorities because of adaptation for climate change. If we don't, this will reflect on the migration crisis. This will, so there is an agriculture economy in Central America that depends on climate as it existed before, and it is changing. And the support of international community or cooperation there and then private sector needs to shift the priorities is how to think and how to develop that region, thinking about the need of ad adapting for climate change. And this is not on the, you know, the center of the agenda, and it should be. I think on the migration issue, not only I think the, the, the development aspects that we are discussing, but we had a, an, a, an amazing example with the Venezuelan refugee crisis in which the region received 5 million uh, uh, migrants from Venezuela, especially South America, uh, and without international help and without a major crisis, right? In terms of uh, the, the local, of course there is, uh, uh, there was, it wasn't an easy process, but there is a lesson there, which is we need a regional perspective for migration for how to receive refugees, for how to, uh, and we are seeing that, the, the, and you discussed that with Ambassador Jacobson, the Haitian crisis were people that were uh, 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 fighting from South America. So it is because of the lack of uh, uh, cooperation with South, South America to uh, uh, have the ability to maintain those people in their economy there, that those people fled to the US. So I think that we need to have a, a Pan-American perspective on, on, on migration that doesn't exist right now, that is clearly mm -hmm. focused on the southern border in the US, and we need to shift there. Finally, a, more integrated, a more integrated policy on migration that, that integrates the whole region, as you say, not just border oriented. And that would require more cooperation among many countries that may not see eye to eye today, right? Brazil being maybe one example. Definitely, definitely. But I think that the other point is, what is the U.S. offering for the region, right? And I think there is, of course, a competition with China right now that is on the table. And I think the U.S. has an advantage compared to it, which is democracy, right? And if the U.S. can establish a relationship with the region is based 
I think, on the idea of we need to reinforce uh, democratic institutions, we need to reinforce civil society, and we need to think of what, what is a green development for the region, right? What is for the Amazonian region, what can be a development that takes into account standing forest development? What is the adaptation development for Central America? This should be at the center of the cooperation, much more than law enforcement, drug policy, which has uh, 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 been the center of the cooperation for many dec decades uh, uh, from the US uh, with the regions. Well, this is, this is the second in our series of Latin American newsmaker events that we're doing here at DevEx in cooperation with the support of the OSF in part because we think the region and the issues are so urgent today and deserve more attention. I wonder in the last moment we have left, Pedro, is there anything about what OSF is doing in the region that you want others watching this to know or you, or you want them to connect with your work? Definitely. I think beyond climate change and climate action that we've discussed, but I think it's a key issue for the region right now. I think the pandemic has raised another issue, which is what we call care economy. You know, care became such an important part of our lives during the pandemic. And we know uh, that we want, you know, women won't receive, uh, you know, the same, you know, won't, won't have equal pay. If you don't pay for care, what, what, if, what is like care is valued for the society. And I think there is an opportunity there. Uh, we are seeing in Colombia, in Argentina, in Mexico, in, in Brazil, in some uh, local administration, policies directly, uh, 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 thought to develop this care economy, which I think with a climate green economy with the perspective of care can be at the center of building back uh, the region after this uh, huge crisis. Those are the main things that we are supporting uh, with the democratic environment in the region. Well, that's a fantastic kicking off point for our next newsmaker with Santiago Levy, where we're gonna be talking about issues exactly like that, the informal economy and how do you create the social safety net and the, the new legislation and regulations to support the, the lowest end of the income scale in many countries in Latin America. Thank you so much, Pedro Ramage, for the time, for the support of this series. It's great to see you. Appreciate you being here. Thank you very much, Rosa Black. Raj, nice to see you again after those conversations. Um, so fascinating, really interesting to hear the perspective um, from both Roberta, you know, the US foreign policy space and from Pedro thinking a little bit more regionally in Brazil. Um, what are your major takeaways from the conversations that you just had? Yeah, great discussions. You know, I, I feel like we heard some really interesting perspectives. For me, it gets to this question of the humanitarian to development nexus, you know, that we talk about so much and for so many regions around the world, but there's an immediate crisis, right? I mean, we've seen incomes drop dramatically due to the pandemic. Uh, there's so many health consequences and knock-on effects. There's people moving on the move because of climate and because of gang violence and other reasons. So things have to be done today, now. There's urgency. On the other hand, I think both Roberta and Pedro rightly said, these are long-term development challenges. There's no quick fix. So that was one of my takeaways. Uh, I did love the fact that both of them were thinking about solutions and, had, and presented some real ideas for what could be done. Yeah, I think that's the hardest part of this region as a whole, right, is remembering that there are really acute immediate needs, particularly when we think about the Venezuelan refugees that we heard about um, in the Northern Triangle, you know, people moving from that region to the U.S. border. But the U.S. has been investing in these regions for a long time. We have been putting money towards solving these problems. And oftentimes our political situation here domestically, switching administrations, switching parties, changes the way money is being spent. Previous programs get cut off and we never really had that opportunity to see, is this gonna do what it was meant to be doing? And you know, the border becomes a hot button political issue here in the US. And so there is that pressure to do something fast. And I think we do sometimes lose that development perspective. And you have to remember, I mean, this could take 10, 15, 20 years to see the fruits of these investments. And that's really hard for a president that has a four year political term here in the US. Yeah, and it's important to remember the U.S. has sowed the seeds of so much of the dysfunction in the region, right? I mean, we are we are this elephant, basically, that has trampled off in many of these countries, especially thinking about the history in Central America. And, and we're dealing with a lot of the after effects, and people are living with a lot of the after effects of political dysfunction and, and polarization. If you look at the calendar of elections coming up and some of the immediate kind of authoritarians or, or wannabe authoritarians in parts of the region... 
there's a lot of current immediate crisis, even though you're absolutely right. It is a 10, 15 year or longer agenda if US foreign policy kind of gets on the right track of investing in civil society and building these institutions as both Roberta and, and Pedro talked about. Exactly. And I think the you know, the moment that we find ourselves with all of these elections and both Roberta and Pedro mentioned this multiple times, really the importance of democracy and of a strong civil society. Um, none of these problems are going to be solved if citizens don't feel like they can rely on their own government to meet their own needs. People in the Northern Triangle, they're migrating because their governments can't get them what they need. People in Venezuela, they're fleeing because the government can't get them what they need. Uh, we're seeing that problem in Nicaragua. De, you know, democracy is is going down. And I think it's just it's we have to remember that that really is the root of a lot of these issues. And that's really challenging because that requires the U.S. essentially to, um, you know, try to be incentivizing another government to act in a particular way. Yeah, and that's a great uh, kicking off point to our next in the series of conversations is we, we've planned the last event with Santiago Levy, who's a who's a noted development economist in the region. Um, he comes from Mexico, where he had a long career building up the social safety nets there, which have now become very popular all across the region. There's Bolsa Familia in Brazil, for example. But this idea that people living in poverty may, by sending their kids to school, get a cash transfer, get some kind of government subsidy. It's pulled millions of people out of poverty. And we're going to talk to him about, are there ways governments can do more of what Roberta was talking about today, just delivering on the very basic needs of people using these kinds of social safety net programs? Can these be expanded? What are the opportunities? And I think it's particularly important at the moment when there's so many new governments and so many elections coming in the region. So I'm eager to hear from him as we, as we continue to think about not just the challenges, but what some of these solutions could be. Yeah, that is going to be a great conversation. Really looking forward to that one. Um, well, thank you, Raj, so much. Um, it was great hearing today um, from Roberta and Pedro. Thanks so much to both of you for joining us. Um, anything else, Raj, our audience should know before we sign off today? I would just say stay tuned. Uh, follow up. Tell us what you thought of this event and uh, look out and, and register for the next one coming up. All right. And thanks again to the Open Society Foundations for helping us present these events. We will see you for the next one. Thank you.